In this module, we've learned about pigments and ochres and the reasons why ochres are a natural choice for the Earth's and humanity's first pigments. So just to review, pigments are materials that are deeply colored, uh, preferably they are easily ground into a powder and mixed with various media, and they are stable over long periods of time. Uh, the ochres, or the earth colors, are iron oxides and iron oxyhydroxides that are very useful for these, uh, for these purposes and are uh, natural choices for, uh, for the very first pigments because they are abundantly available near the earth's surface. Um, they are easy to get to. We don't require deep mines or uh, e extensive processing in order to turn them into pigments. In many cases, they can just be used in their natural state or dried and powdered to be used as pigments. Um, they are deeply colored in a variety of shades of orange and brown and yellow and red. And they're very stable because these oxides and oxyhydroxides have already been weathered. So they are products of the processes like oxidation that would normally break down other minerals and other materials. So these pigments can last thousands of years with very little deterioration or alteration. So uh, in this unit uh, on my side, you learned about the various ways in which ochre could be used from simply uh, using it like a crayon uh, in its raw form. And I'm holding up here a piece of uh, red ochre um, to powdering and purifying. And one of the exercises I uh, gave you was to actually try uh, pur purifying your own ochre from some colored dirt near your house or mixing some of your own paint and playing with it uh, with various recipes. Um, but as you will have seen in the case studies, uh, the, the way that ochre performs and the ways in which it could be used vary greatly from artist to artist and from technique to technique. Uh, ochre is a fantastic choice for uh, transferring drawings and for elaborating underdrawings. Uh, it's great for uh, the fresco technique because it doesn't react with the plaster as it's being absorbed into the wall. Um, and its inexpensive nature and, and how plentiful it is makes it fantastic for uh, underpainting. Um, and I wanted to show you uh, this as part of my research for preparing this class, um, I took a, I did a workshop uh, and learned how to work with encaustic paints. And you should recall that uh, those are uh, pigments mixed with uh, beeswax or sometimes a, a combination of beeswax and some other substances. And uh, what I did here was I actually reproduced the stages that I showed you um, in one of our case studies of uh, creating an eye uh, for a one of those Fayum mummy portraits. Now this of course is much larger than it would have been uh, in the original painting, but uh, it was a really interesting exercise. And I wanna show you one last thing about uh, encaustic. This is some encaustic that dried and you can see that it, it tends to sort of dry in little chips and chunks. Um, and the moment you take your brush out of the liquid encaustic, uh, and this picture this on a, on a heating uh, element, I used an old frying pan. Um, the moment you take your brush out, that paint begins to solidify immediately. Um, and so it's a really challenging medium to work with. And that's why we see all of those tool marks and all of that texture in those uh, Fayum mummy portraits.